Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to the first Museum Biennale in the world. We are happy to have you all on, on a virtual platform, and we know the challenges of last year, but we are glad of the silver lining that allows so many people from around the world to participate in this Biennale. This panel discussion is about the making of the Bihar Museum, uh, and it, the panel constitutes of Sri Anjani Kumar Singh, who, along with many other hats, happens to be the nodal officer who stirred this museum project right from conceiving the um, idea to the various staggered openings to now the Bihar Museum Biennale. I'm Batul Raj Mehta. I run a museum planning firm from Mumbai and I have been involved as part of Lord Cultural Resources, which was the museum planner of, of the Bihar Museum. Again, along with Anjani Ji, right from the conceptualization to some of the initial openings. We have Rahul Gore on the panel with us, who heads Opolis Architects, who were partners of Marquis and Associates for this project for designing the architecture of the museum. And we have Anthony Lopez, who heads Lopez Design, which has done the award-winning branding, communication, and the wayfinding signage of the Bihar Museum. The way we have structured this panel discussion is that we'll spend about 15 minutes where each of us will walk you through how the museum came about, and then there'll be a, another half an hour of a, a question and answers, as, and then we'll open it to the audience to send in some of their questions. Anthony, we can start the presentation. The presentation is in three parts. So there'll be the first part managed by Batul, followed by you, Rahul Gore, and then me. Batul's presentation is running on automated mode, and so is mine. And uh, Rahul, you'll speak uh, and run your presentation. Just let me know on the slide. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah. So the Bihar Museum was conceived as a complementary museum to the Patna Museum, but also as a star attraction, which could look at inculcating Bihari pride, promote tourism, and uh, also look at an integrated approach, whether it's the exhibitions, the institution plan, which was about the market analysis and the financial model, and the architecture. So we began with the collection analysis, looking at all the objects, the range, the scale, the, the aesthetics and the exquisite beauty of the objects. And we looked at its target audience. So just I'll continue talking about the backdrop to the museum that while we looked at an integrated methodology, we also looked at, yeah. at who our target visitor is and we identified the target visitors as not just the tourists. Uh, Anthony, you'll have to go back about a few slides. Uh, not just the tourists, but also the, uh, uh, the local visitors and the school kids who all, yeah. when you see them in any of the museums in Bihar, you see that there's, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of urge to learn. So all of that came together as, Anthony, you'll have to go back a couple of slides if you can. Yes, that's great. We can start from here. So all of this came together in a facility yeah. strategy and a program which became the basis of the, the architectural brief or where we looked at scale, we looked at zones <clears throat> in terms of what was ticketed, what was open to public, what was, what was a secure access, and also what would be the sustainability standards for the museum in terms of a Griha approach. At the architectural competition, we had five uh, of the international architects uh, really uh, noteworthy in their own fields and with Indian partners. And it was awarded to Maki and Associates along with Apollos. Uh, while the architecture was going on, we started looking at the exhibition design and we did multiple visioning sessions with historians, with citizen groups, and with children to develop a narrative and a strategy where it allows them to engage with the history of Bihar. And this we took ahead uh, in terms of what sections the museum would have, whether it would be history, art, and special displays. Anthony, I think the slides again stuck. Uh, and in 2013, the construction began on site. Uh, yeah, so in 2000, I'll wait for Anthony to get back, but I, I can go ahead describing what is happening. In 2013, the, the site, uh, uh, picked up speed and we had a 14 acre site and 
and it was decided that the first phase of the museum would be the, the children's section and the orientation galleries. The orientation gallery, since it was opening much earlier than the other galleries, would explain what would come in the next few years in each of the galleries, while the children's section would be all about wow and about immersing in history and the whole hands-on, minds-on approach. The children's section also looked at the wildlife along with the history. So the orientation section for the children's gallery was is very different. It, it allows you to glimpse with a little bit of naughtiness and a little bit of play about how you enter the wildlife sanctuary, which is overlaid with the Jataka tales. From here, you move to the, the historical sections um, and you have some of the funny aspects of the animals and the wildlife, whether it's the poop diaries of the rhinos, which uh, interestingly, the poop and the rhino become very uh, uh, selfie points. And uh, the, the approach has been about engaged learning, but using technology and hands-on uh, approach to bring history alive, whether it's through understanding the spy network of, of Chanakya through a, a touch screen or through a comic book uh, a dialogue between characters from history. And then discovering how archaeology was shaped in Bihar through an entire section on understanding archaeology. The history galleries have been staggered since 2017 with various openings. 2020 hasn't helped with some of the galleries, but we still have got a majority of the museum operational, talking about Nalanda, about medieval Bihar, about the exquisite uh, art pieces in its galleries. But how did we go about it? We looked at the stories that needed to be told and, and looked at detailing them out. And then we took the stories and we looked at how the visitors would engage. The, the visitor engagement and experience is something which we focus on a lot in, in all our projects and all our work because you want to bring that out. And then we looked at researching and layering the content with visuals, with audio, with, with interactives and recreations. And all of it came together in terms of exhibition graphics, which complemented the collections, the recreations, to create an environment which is, which allows you to experience the various period of history, even if you don't read anything, even if you don't stare at an artifact, you pass through various periods of history. And some of it is overlaid with audio and allows you to learn about the living heritage, the, the legends, the mythology, especially the regional arts gallery. Behind the scenes, there was constant fabrication, testing of the fabrications and the installation so that it could take the wear and tear, especially the children's gallery, because you have children jumping over a lot of things and playing around. And then it led to the opening of the museum where we have dignitaries and leaders and officials from around the world visiting the museum and offering their inputs on it. I'll hand this over to Rahul to talk about the architecture of the museum. Rahul, the stage is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, the idea today is just to give you all an overall uh, sense of the building. I think people are from around um, uh, the world are watching it. So uh, I'll just guide you all and do a walk through the building. Uh, this is how the building sits within the city of Patna. You see the Ganges River in the background, and it sits along Main Bailey Road. The High Court is just out of the screen on the right hand side. Uh, but uh, you can see that it has its stately kind of present, presence within the city. The yeah, next. At the same time, um, uh, uh, the idea of this building was uh, Mr. Maki, uh, who was the main architect, uh, has already spoken of collective form and how we did not want to make a building, but instead a collection of buildings that kind of um, uh, became building blocks within the city. So the idea was not to create um, a, a large museum a building which is imposing onto this onto the city, but rather a collection of several building blocks, which kind of adds to the urban design. Um, museum entrances are always tricky, especially in India. And you can see that here, the entrance has been intentionally located far away from two very important nodes, the Hartali mode and the uh, Boring Road mode, uh, just to help uh, ease the traffic on the, in the city. And uh, the building then, you can see it in the model here, uh, where you have a lot of buffering green zones on either side, on the west and the east and the building um, uh, orients itself along the street. Uh, next. Uh, the design of the canopy space is always challenging. It has to take care of a lot of activity, especially with security, with multiple people coming in. So the scale was a 25 meter by 25 meter 
uh, cantilever, partly cantilevered uh, uh, canopy next. And then the design of the lobby spaces, are, it's, it's very tricky and very important because at some point there are uh, over hundreds of people and at some point there are just small groups of people. So to design a space uh, that can um, uh, uh, take all these kind of volumes of people and still not uh, retain its character is very important. Here you see the entrance on uh, axis with the water body. Uh, this is another view of the lobby that looks towards the main galleries as one approaches them. Next. And on the opposite side of this is actually the Children's Museum. Uh, this is actually a, pro a, pro a photograph under construction uh, where you can see the 36 meter span uh, dome. It's a, concrete, uh, it's a circular drum uh, with an elliptical concrete roof that's actually suspended and there is no structure. It's uh, with an open oculus in the center. Go on next. Uh, the building, uh, the same children's drum when seen from the outside, but the children it connects to the garden and the landscape. Uh, landscape is a very important part of this project and helps integrate the building with its surroundings. We've used cotton and steel, we've used terracotta brick and white uh, sandstone as the three main features on the outside, material on the outside. One. Um, the diagram on the left shows the overall organization of the museum. The yellow, the orange zones are the galleries, uh, the main galleries on the left hand side and the children's gallery on the right hand side. The pink zones are the public uh, zones which are related to entrance and uh, distribution of people. And the green zones at the back are the way, are more, uh, very important heart of the museum, which actually helps it to run well the services along with the storage uh, uh, of all the artifacts. Uh, the main administration building is seen as a series of uh, smaller floors that go up. So that's actually the only uh, uh, tall structure within the uh, building. And it's largely a ground plus one story structure. Now what's unique next, what's unique about the museum is it's, it's got a layers, uh, it's got seven courtyards. And uh, I think that's what makes it very unique in, in this world. Uh, this is one of the courtyards and each courtyard has a different shape, different size. It comes about from the shape of the site, from the program and has a character. And also more importantly, has a varying degree of noise because Patna is a very noisy city. So each of these courtyards, as you move from the public spaces to the uh, exhibition spaces, uh, changes and keeps one in tune with the day of time of the day. Go on next. This is another courtyard, which is actually the exhibition within the exhibition sequence. And here you can see it's uh, completely white from the inside. It has high volumes. So the sound levels completely drop here. Next. So the exhibition galleries, which Batul Apli explained, are uh, visualized as black boxes. And I think what happens is when you have black boxes like this, uh, the time spent between moving between galleries is important. Next. So what we've got all along the museum is this alternate mode of trans, uh, uh, travel, which we call the cloister spaces, uh, where you get uh, amazing daylight uh, that's uh, kind of shaded uh, through the day and evening with the sun. And in, in this sequence, in the middle is this kind of a lounge space, uh, which is the image on the right, uh, which has a place for uh, uh, contemporary art and artists from uh, Bihar. Uh, Ram Kumar has developed this and um, it, it aptly sits within this triple height naturally lit uh, space. So while uh, uh, the insides of the building are important, it's also the outsides. And here you'll see how every terrace space has also got grass, which helps keep the building cool. It keeps kind of insulates the building and also it, it mitigates its complete impact on the environment. Uh, so as we speak, there's actually an exhibition of this on the making of the BR Museum, which is running at the venue itself, uh, where we've looked at uh, uh, the building in larger, greater detail. Next, looked at uh, uh, kind of uh, the construction processes. Here there is just a snippet of what uh, the cotton panels and the process that was used to not only put them up, but weather them before and then get them installed. At the same time, how the galleries were very important and how they were uh, constructed with pre-construction, with pre-cast concrete to help aid the entire process. Next. So this museum has received the five-star GRIA rating, which is the highest environmental rating. And um, uh, we are very happy to say that um, uh, the building and the government has taken complete initiative in ensuring, giving us full support in achieving this uh, green rating for the building. Next. So as uh, Mr. Markey uh, had said, uh, it, that is the museum building must be appreciated by not only the client and users, but also by the general public. In this sense, the building must be timeless because time will be the final judge of the building. And I think to us as, uh, as architects and urban designers for this project, it's most important is this timeless quality. And we hope now that it's, 
the building is now aging and it's uh, weathering well. Uh, the, it, it continues to do so and have a life of its own as it uh, tries to live within the city of Patna. Thank you. Over to Anthony. Wanting to you know, bring back the ethos of the Bihari people. It was primarily to invoke a self-pride within the people. And that was the main vision that the chief minister laid out. The competition itself was set up as a competition for an Indian architect to team up with an international architect who had museum experience. We were given a very complicated program as part of the competition, and the site was quite generous. The surroundings of the site are not particularly large scale. There's also a lot of small independent buildings. So when we consider those conditions together, Mr. Maki thought that the best approach would be rather than making a singular massive building, would be to divide the building into discrete parts so that each part could respond specifically to its needs, to its program, create a sense of serenity and create a series of spaces in the building that made it feel like an oasis from the chaos that was surrounding it. And the strategy for doing that, it goes back again to dividing the building into parts and layers within the building of um, building space and open space and building space and open space. And that's where the whole strategy of the building courtyard, building courtyard came into play. Uh, we've used a kind of brown palette uh, to unify the whole campus. So there is granite at the base and then there's cotton and uh, that cotton repeats at several uh, locations uh, all through the length of Bailey Road. The sequence of spaces was very clearly established uh, in the program. And there's an introductory gallery called the pre-show gallery. The exhibition spaces were dictated to be complete black box. There's a secondary pathway called the cloisters, which offers a sense of relief we thought it was important to have um, other ways to walk through the building which connect you to the outside, which connect you to natural light. So it's a dual system of circulation that we've set up. One which goes through the galleries internally and another which is cloisters which connects around the building uh, separate from that. Lucky was very conscious of not wanting to make the building too overwhelming, seem too large in the context. So by sloping the building back from the street, that was sort of the mechanism by which we tried to control the overall scale of the building and the feeling of the building within the site. That it must be in our uh, Now I'm going to switch over to uh, the next presentation. Uh, I have added this slide blink so because it's a change of subject from architecture to branding. So we blink. Uh, my presentation is going to run a bit fast. Uh, so, and I'm not going to speak much. So there you don't have to blink in between. So, yeah. So I'm just making this statement. Design is a powerful strategic tool if comprehendedly, uh, comprehended and used appropriately. So it's just a teaser to, to get started. So uh, the firm basically, which I represent is Lope Design. And uh, we are a full service multi design studio with diverse offering in three core areas, which is strategy, design, and activation. Uh, and Bihar Museum commissioned us. Uh, again, uh, we were shortlisted as uh, the design house, which could represent, uh, create basically the brand strategy, the brand identity system, communication collaterals, website strategy, and design, wayfinding, signage, and systems. You know? And we got in uh, a large group of people to, to manage this, this very wide scope of work. Uh, now I'm switching over to the presentation, which will take you through the journey which we took to arrive at the various uh, outputs. And you can see that happening. So of course this museum got, this identity system got several awards. So we all know that 
the, the entire region of Bihar, historically speaking, um, is a land basically with, with great uh, you know, happenings and great people. And this is the representation diagram which came, we, we, we created to represent what the museum could stand for. The target audience was very complex and wide. And this is the positioning of the museum, gateway to the past and the portal to the future. And we thought this can single-handedly position Bihar on the global map, where it becomes a place of reckoning. So this is a place basically which had the great empire with the body, the mind and the spirit taken care of. And thereby it became the ultimate dwelling place, the Param Vihara. So we said, what should be the personality of a place like this? This is Amitabh Bachchan of Amitabh Bachchan, right? So in a museum journey, so there's a physical journey, but today we know that there's a virtual journey, which is far bigger and far wider than the, than the physical journey. So we want to make people want to come to Bihar Museum. We want people to know world over the story of Bihar Museum. So how should a museum like this behave? So we came up with this little book with talks in first person. It's not all of it, but then it's up to you to decipher. And this is the entire strategy at three levels, which is identity, behavior, and performance. So how should the museum function? And that gave us the basis of creating the identity. This identity is very unique among other identities, as you can see. It's complex, it's multi-layered. The entire visual language again is multi-layered because we wanted people not to look at uh, a sculpture and just look at it from one meaning. It has got multiple layers, many meanings, a lot of depth. This is at the entrance. The communication collateral has got Devnagari, which is prominent. This is the bands for the children. Tickets have various types so that you can talk about it. Takeaways, a wide range of takeaways. We did the wayfinding and signage system and very early we decided along with the architects and the clients to have the wayfinding basically complement the architecture rather than the branding. So it complements the building. We created the entire website system which basically can compare it to any museum systems across the world. So we created this entire system architecture and wireframe design to contain all the information now and in the future. So it becomes a repository for various stakeholders. It is social media. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Raul. So, so the, the making of the Bihar Museum is, is proof that developing a museum, you require not just consultants, but also expertise, which are whether it's design, whether it's branding, whether it's interpretive strategy, and the contractors and the fabricators who also given their, their blood and sweat in ensuring that the museum comes together. But Anjaniji, my first question to you is the moot question that how and why did the Honorable Chief Minister Nitish Kumarji and the entire team of the Bihar government decide on developing a museum of this kind? You are aware that Bihar has a very rich heritage and cultural history. And we already had a museum called Patna Museum. Yes. So we are planning to expand that museum because the artifacts that we had we are not able to display properly. So we are planning to expand that museum, Patna Museum. 
So our chief minister, Mr. Nitish Kumar, visited that site, that Patna Museum, and then he realized that the artifacts that we have, the quantity, that was one, and then the display, proper uh, people's experience, and all that, that is not of uh, national or international standard. So at that time, he wrote in a register that the type of uh, rich history we have, culture we have, artifacts we have. So that re requires a new museum of international standard and where all these things would be displayed. Of course, Patna Museum will remain. So he said that let uh, Bihar Museum be history museum and uh, Patna Museum will be a complementary museum with modern history and contemporary art, etc. So with that idea, this concept of Bihar Museum came. Then, but uh, government also decided that our generation, that future generation, should know what was the rich history of Bihar. And not only people of Bihar, but people of the country, India and the world should also know our rich heritage. Because many people have said that the history of Bihar is history of India. Patliputra, which is now Patna, was capital of India. And at that time, uh, India was bigger than what it is today. So we had all that uh, thing in our mind. Mm -hmm. Another aspect was that in modern India, after independence, no new museum of international standard could come up in any state, either by state government or central government. Our museums were either done by British or some Raja Rajwaras, the kings and princely estates. So a modern contemporary museum, that was the requirement of the country. So we thought that by making a new international standard museum, we are filling that void. So that was the background of making this museum and, and, and it's, we wanted this to be pride because we have a very rich history and culture and Bihar once was a very, very prosperous state. And we had all these Nalanda University uh, and dynasties, big dynasties like Maurya uh, and Chandragupta was our famous king. So all that history has to be told to the next generation. So that was the background. So it's, it has been a 10 year journey that I have witnessed with, with the entire team. But, and we, all, we often see in other projects and other announcements that governments do that they all have this vision, but very rarely we have seen that the vision is consistently followed through process, through through execution for, for such a project to develop over a, a longer period. Uh, how would you say that the entire government machinery came together for this vision? You know, this, uh, there was a commitment from the whole government, especially under the leadership of our chief minister. There was a uh, team that was given responsibility to get it executed of that standard. That's why we went for global things. I told you earlier because for last many years, no good new museum could come up in India. So we were not knowing who are the best architect for museum, who will be the concept consultant, who will do the branding and design because that type of experience, unfortunately, was not available. So the team was given that task that go for it. And we were given that budget in the beginning and money was never a problem. And we were given the prime land in Patna, center of Patna. So all that goes to... So that government has a very high priority, very great commitment for this. And a team was created and that team executed with help of all of you. Thank you, sir. So uh, as an observation, I've seen that uh, even when officials were transferred and new officials uh, took, took those posts up, they also continued with the same vision. It didn't allow the, the project to have any breaks or something. It was, it was such a smooth transition. Through, through various uh, uh, officials, teams changing at the government and all of that. And that's something which we find very rare. So I think it's a big compliment to the entire Bihar government team for when, when that was, kind of consistency. When it was conceived, uh, I was made nodal officer for the Bihar Museum. I was not secretary of art culture, but I was in education. But government said, they notified me as a nodal officer for Bihar Museum. And I continued on this post, though my posts changed many times, but I continued to be nodal officer of Bihar Museum. I am still nodal officer of Bihar Museum. 
So that gives a continuity because a one person for eight, nine, ten years is overseeing development of museum. Then you get that type of you don't get problems. Atul, can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, firstly, I think uh, congratulations to you, Anjani ji. The strong leadership and continuation of leadership is what basically brought about the subtification. Batul, basically something which uh, you know is very intriguing. Normally, in projects like these, as I've seen historically speaking, uh, project planners are not brought on board right in the beginning before uh, architects and before other designers and all in place. What has that happened here differently, and and what brought this process into place? So, uh, so Anthony, what happened was that the Bihar government, as Anjani J mentioned, they had a vision of wanting to do something at international stature. So they started reaching out to museum planning firms around the world to just understand the process. And that's how they had even reached out to Lord Cultural Resources. And I used to head South Asia for Lord Cultural Resources that time from India. But they reached out to many museum planning firms around the world because you did not have any other museum planning firms in India on what could be the best practices and processes to follow. And they took inputs from everybody to develop the RFP to get the first museum planning team on board, which could then conduct the entire architectural selection process, the competition, and the, the next few tendering processes, whether it was the branding, whether it was uh, tendering for the exhibition fabricators, all of that happened as part of the RFP, which was for the museum planner. So the concept was developed and then how, how the subsequent teams could come and how they could integrate was all laid down in the master plan. Fantastic. So it, it is unusual because you, you often have government teams which look at uh, what's the fastest way of doing the project rather than the best way of doing the project. And, and for the Bihar Museum, that was the approach which was taken was what's the best for the project and and the government teams and Anjani ji just went along with with let's do the best for this project. So the, the next question I would like to ask is uh, is uh, something Anjani ji would with to do us with, with the architectural selection uh, process that you usually do not see governments in India following this kind of a rigorous competition. And uh, uh, Rahul, you can uh, uh, tell me more about it because you all go through a lot of architectural competitions. That uh, Anjiji, uh, how is it that this kind of a template, which can become a best practice for architectural selection, is not followed as much as it should be? That's a very nice question. In fact, when we when going for selection of architect, uh, an international jury was formed. And which was, I think, did not happen, at least it did not happen in Bihar. Bihar, normally the building department will do the tendering. And from that tender process, the lowest rate and the person will be selected. But in this, we had an international jury. And then we had given weightage for their, you know, what they have already done. And financial part, of course, was part of it. And international jury was though chaired by the chief secretary of Bihar, but he didn't have voting right. So it was left to specialist experts. We had the director of uh, Victoria and Albert Museum. We had some lady from Iceland. Then people expert on environment so, and the artist also. So Gupta was part of that international jury. So these uh, stakeholders were given full play. And, and they were allowed. I was that time secretary culture and of course, uh, nodal officer. So it's, it's, we said that let the whole team decide and let the experts decide, which normally does not happen in government. It is in a very hierarchized form and there is an open tender and the lowest quotation. And here, uh, another thing that we found different was that shortlisted, I think I remember there are 26 architects that, uh, in the beginning, they came on the board and five were shortlisted and they all were uh, requested to make a presentation. All five made present presentation. And by very rigorous method, then the three and from three that one was selected. So this procedure was very nice. And, and, and we're very happy with that process. Thank you, sir. Atul, 
I have yeah. a follow through question on the process. So um, uh, how did the branding process come along? I mean, so we were a little bit, uh, when we were initially invited among many, uh, we were a little bit skeptical and also surprised at the fact that, uh, you know, we've been called for branding of a museum, which never think normally doesn't happen at this level, you know, at this scale, you know, where, where people would just settle for a logo uh, in short, right? Yeah. So I think, again, the credit goes to uh, Anjani ji and the entire government machinery because they wanted to do what was the best. So when we expose them to the best practices from around the world and how international museums, whether it's the Met, the MoMA, the Louvre, everybody has got a strong brand, brand identity, and especially museums like MoMA, where, where you see the logo and you know what it is about. And when we walk them through these museums and 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 how the branding works, they immediately said, okay, let's go for a proper branding and communication exercise rather than get a logo designed by a, a, a designer. Because there is a lot of thought process which goes but like what you explained in your presentation and all of that could come together here. Uh, Anjaniji, you may want. Yeah, yeah. There is a small anecdote that I want to say. In fact, when the idea of all these signages came, so there was some, pricing. So the office, the building department office said, sir, for signages, why spend so much? Anybody can do that signage. You just have to write on a board and so, so direction. Then that question was there. And most of the engineers had that in mind because there is no modern signage, no real signage in any of these buildings. So then Anthony brought some lady, I remember, she made a presentation. The, on the importance of signage and gave a story some some airport got you know there's some fire in some airport and more people died because there was no proper signages and then 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 there was a whole research and people came out with idea what should be the height of signage color of signage font of signage all those things came so then he explained the importance of signage that from anywhere people should whatever requirement they have they should be able to find out so that gave the importance of signage. Earlier, still in government, people think just write your name on the name plate. And then you think that that is the signage or toilet, or you put a male or female figure and say it's a gents toilet, ladies toilet. But then Anthony ex explained to us. Yes, sir. Atul, I wanted to um, just continue on your earlier point of uh, the architectural competition. Uh, so, you know, uh, what I've observed is there are, there are two, two things that are very important. One is, of course, a brief. And in this case, uh, uh, because LCR was involved, there was a fantastic brief. And that ensured that the building got completed with hardly any changes. In fact, it, it got eventually completed with just a 2% variation on the cost, which is fantastic. But more importantly, it, it was a vision laid out by the government, but the conviction to back that vision. You know, we've seen that a lot of times if there are fantastic juries. And then the jury makes its recommendation, but then uh, because there is always something that comes up and that conviction, the very process that has been set up by the uh, people uh, is broken. Uh, but here, I think what was very important was the conviction that the government uh, laid in that we've chosen the best, we follow the correct process, we have chosen the best consultants, let's go with them and back them. And I think that uh, was an environment uh, which was very conducive to the project coming up. So it was not, could, the project could fall through at any point. You know, we've seen that, in the, but the, the, the conviction that was there that yes, we have followed the correct process. And I think that was very important. And I think yes. Janiji had led that from the front and that was very important. Absolutely. And also uh, because this became a process which the Bihar Museum followed, a lot of the other projects that the uh, various departments in the Bihar government have developed, which are cultural or museum related projects, follow the same template and the same conviction. So we are seeing the, that kind. I, I can imagine that in another five to eight years, uh, Patna is going to be, have its own cultural district with, with museums, science centers, and, and some of the most interesting places or, or uh, uh, it's, it's like the museum islands which you have in Europe. I think Patna has the potential to become that now with, with the way these projects have developed across. Uh, so the, uh, uh, Rahul, I'm going to ask you another question about uh, the architecture itself because we walked through it and you've shown us on the video. 
but what were your first responses when you saw the brief and the site and 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 did they did they all translate into the campus approach that you all took so i think um, uh, you know uh, one of the most difficult things to capture is actually the sound levels that we experienced when we first came to patna i mean me coming from bombay i found patna to be noisy and uh, i can just imagine what the japanese thought so you know i think that the sound levels was a very important part and that to capture how do you capture that in a design and i think this idea of a, a collective uh, campus kind of an approach uh, which also of course incidentally came about because of the time frames uh, you know the ground water table is very high you don't want to do basements to keep the project flexible uh, so that any change in one thing doesn't affect the change in another so i think all these ideas came about um, uh, uh, in such a way that we could actually build the whole site and being a large site and having primary ground floor structures what one could do is build the entire site at the same time and uh, that really uh, aided uh, the the kind of uh, 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 the government's intention of completing the project within a defined timeline and making sure that it's built with good uh, quality uh, and this aspect of sound was something that i think as we uh, went through the design process we kept really um, uh, focusing on that and how does one create a space and it should be outside you know we have seven courtyards and how do you still make those courtyards kind of um, you know uh, have a identity of their own without just the blaring sound of horns uh, so i think those were yeah. aspects that were uh, crucial to this uh, design and 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 that's something which all of us have experienced that the courtyards become like a, a small haven in some ways and and they have got their inner peace and probably and and the museum the entire journey has become a journey over space where you you experience the outside and the inside but also what you mentioned that as far as a dialogue with the neighborhood uh, surely the conceptual di- uh, direction has carried out uh, right till the end for the, right right from the first sketches of uh, maki sir to now when we see how how a, how a visitor experiences the museum we see that that initial idea still coming through so so that's something which is quite interesting i think also uh, the use of courtyards is i think what is unique uh, it gives it an indian identity you know the building itself you say uh, you know, it, it's what makes it indian to me it's a, the light quality in the building and that light quality comes about from these courtyards so uh, the courtyards have really um, uh, uh, given it that uh, because that anchors it in patna and it anchors it to the site so i think that's really the essence of the architecture that developed around it. Yeah. but rahul uh, would you say that uh, that this is what makes this particular museum stand out from all other museums or is it more to that um i i think it's unique in the sense of the seven courtyards and uh, uh, museum because i think mr marki has done a lot of museums uh, but he's never had he's had a courtyard or two courtyards uh, but to have seven courtyards you know it's not easy because the surface area of the building increases you're exposing the building that much more to the weather Uh, but i think uh, in this case this was very early and of course the site had large trees so we in, in fact introduced three courtyards post the competition to accommodate those large trees so uh, i think all that aided in uh, getting the uh, project anchored to its uh, roots in patna so uh, uh anthony uh, while we are talking about the architecture I'd like to come to the branding in your presentation you mentioned that the positioning of the museum is gateway to the past and portal of the future uh, how is this manifested in the communication of the museum experience uh it's it's, it's a many fold answer i mean let me begin with with the vision basically where the where the chief minister vision was to bring back the glory of bihar it was, i think absolutely was explicit and clear and bring back the pride of the people of bihar uh, uh, and and i think that was critical and important for us to 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 hold on to very strongly uh, state of bihar basically the national sphere to come back in the national scene in the sphere the bihar's history which is multifaceted uh, and incredible in nature so we had to bring back also the aspect of that how the history of bihar is history of india i mean undoubtedly i mean that's where basically lord of india comes from and we were excited to bring that aspect very strongly forward you know then the symbols of communication so right from ashoka who brought in uh, the whole concept of unified india i mean as a king as a ruler you know and he brought in the symbols of the dharm chakra which becomes part of our national flag which is part of our currency 
you know, the inverted lotus and all these these elements basically, which are highly symbolic and 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 you and currently is unifying our country also, you know, and and the people tree, you know, which is also a unified symbol uh, of of uh, not only belonging to the to Buddhism but also belonging to the state of Bihar because it comes from there, you know, and then the most important that the museum as holding the key to key to the future, so it is a fulcrum, it is basically drawing you into the past but also propelling into the future, both constructively and otherwise. So you've got to see that you don't have to doggedly follow the past, but you learn from the past and you propel yourself in the future. So I think that's where basically, and then most importantly, where the museum becomes a bridge and a portal, you know, uh, and, and, and it, it takes you basically, uh, and, and that basically we have brought in in the Surya Rekha, uh, in the tripod trees, you know, which are there. And, and there's this multiplicity of stories, you know, so it, it takes you on this journey. And this journey is about transcending. It's about transformation. It's about awakening. Yeah. No, it is. A, I, I, you rarely see the Devnagri becoming such such an important uh, part of the branding, and I think that's that's amazing because because it needs to be highlighted in that sense. Uh, Anjani ji, I have this question for you, uh, uh, which is about. We've attended a lot of meetings which you have chaired and also the review meetings that you used to have once a month uh, on the progress of the project with all the consultants, all the uh, uh, contractors and the vendors all being there so that all issues could be resolved. But I remember this one line you had said and, and it's, it's been something which has almost become a motto for how we work, which is, Kagas ke ghode mat dodaiye. Uh, which translate to don't don't uh, uh, very simplistically it's it's don't push paper around but but it has got its own bihari charm to it when it's uh, when it is gode mat dod and which was like uh, that nobody would get entangled with the red tape but still all the processes were followed uh, uh, have you take undertaken such a project uh, any other project like this in your tenure yeah, after Bihar Museum, we also have now um, Bapu's Sabhagar, Gyan Bhavan, then Science Museum is coming. Uh, another uh, development, we have a plan for Bapu Museum also on Mahatma Gandhi. Many things have happened after uh, Bihar Museum. But I, I, I am a strong believer, you know, of uh, finding solutions and that you can get we're not by only by doing great uh, explanation or research. People, if you talk to people, they advise you, they give you, they give you, show you the way if you take this, it can happen. It is possible. So I don't like people with great ideas, but you know, it does not get translated. It's okay. better that we give ideas which is feasible, which we can do. And of course, it has to be new and modern the way we want it. But, but only great ideas somehow does not work because getting it translated, because it has to be translated by the team which is available. You cannot get the best people, you cannot get the ideal situation to happen. You have to work in a given situation and you have to perform in that situation. And I found all my, all my consultants, architects and everybody quite considerate. That can happen. Only guarantee they want that they should be hard. Problem in government sometimes is they're not heard properly. Though but they are expert of their domain. I'm getting a request that I should speak in Hindi. So my karao ki kam wo jamin pe hona chahiye. Kewal kagaj pe, kewal presentation me, or kewal bade bade idea me nahi hona chahiye. And because of that, our chief minister also, he is only thing. He is very. He will allow your idea. He will give you a project, but he wants it to be implemented. It's not that you come with 20 ideas and two gets translated in 10 years, then you lose credibility. And we had to prove our credibility because we wanted to do more projects of this nature and establish this museum as a real international museum. Absolutely. Sir, because there were so many different uh, uh, consultants, vendors and contractors, as a nodal officer, what was the most challenging for you? Uh, what was the most challenging aspect of the of the project for you? No, Rahul will become angry, but I, I will say, <laughs> if you if you follow what Maki wanted, 
that would have taken another 20 years maki and rahul wanted which that is that but that was very important because he said they were not ready to compromise on quality so the the agency which was doing the construction they were supposed to find the best material demonstrate and then only use so if you go for you know 100% but it's a government project it has to be completed also it cannot remain you know for that so we compromise 5% because you have to complete it also we many times know the best and the ideal is very difficult to achieve so sometimes you go for good may not be the best so we, so that type of little compromises we had to do but but he was a great taskmaster for that contractor in fact Absolutely. the lnt said, said that they incurred a huge loss in making the hall museum i don't know how true is that <laughs> sir uh, usually we see that most government projects uh, do not uh, do not prefer having multiple tenders they want one tender which takes in everything and which ends up having a lot of compromises now uh, here when we had all these and, and you've uh, explained what was the most challenging aspect for it but integrating with all these different consultants and uh, 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 designers and and different vendors and contractors was it very challenging for you and what is the positive of having all the different tenders it, it's like uh, five brains are better than one brain that brain, one brain can be brilliant but yeah. you know getting five independent people that is one part second part you are able to oversee each everybody is saying architect is saying no no this is a problem that concept or that brand strategy this should happen like this so you are getting input of uh, different agencies and then you are integrating it and executing it and team can team can work but if all these aspects goes to one organization or one agency then then many compromises take place because you know who is overseeing and who is you know there because you know suppose the, i am agency so my architecture section or department is not going to criticize other department absolutely sir. all it's all one but if you have all independent and expert based in their field then they are going to give positive inputs i'm not saying only uh, finding negative things they, they will give you positive inputs which put together i think uh, we've had a, a connection issue with anjani ji's feed so rahul i'll ask you a question in the meantime uh, is that you have been involved and 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 led teams which have won many competitions but this is one of the only pro projects which has translated into a build project so what are the key learnings for a competition project that that you've been part of and and this which has been built which is which ensures that the competition turns into a build project what would you have uh, you would uh, give as inputs to somebody if you had to on on how to convert a winning competition into a build project i think i uh, mentioned this earlier a little bit but uh, it's it's essentially just i think there are just two factors that are really required and i'll just stress them again it's again there should be a good brief and a brief that is uh, stuck to and thought out well because most competitions we see i architect is left to come up with the entire vision but it's that's not the idea it has to have a brief because otherwise that brief goes through too many changes so i think uh, that is one and then second it's nothing but the conviction of the uh, the client uh, agency in backing uh, and saying that what they've thought out and you know if people have followed the correct process typically that conviction comes in and uh, that's when if 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 it's been left to lose uh, then there are just too many other entries coming in and typically competitions fall apart and buildings don't get translated into uh designs don't get translated into buildings so i think i think it's these two it's a, that's the overall environment that's required that's very essential yeah. so uh, i i completely agree i think that that conviction and also the 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 belief in their teams like what anjani ji has mentioned till now uh that has played a big role because even as a as uh, as our team developed the exhibition uh, design aspect it wasn't like one follows the other we were working as closely in understanding the architecture 
as it was developing, as the stories and the narratives for the exhibitions were developing, but also about how do you bridge the idea of having collections which require different climate aspects with, with collections uh, or recreations where children are going to run completely amok. So, so for us, it worked very well that, that the client had planned it and had the belief and the conviction to go ahead with it. And I think that's the same for you all also, because uh, from what you said, that is, there's just been a 2% variation in cost, which is unheard of for any projects, forget government projects, uh, even for private projects, you don't hear something like that. Uh, Anthony, I would like to come to you again uh, in terms of the branding that you've developed. That uh, if you had a blue sky scenario, uh, how would a museum leverage the potential of its branding and in what avenues? I, I think people underestimate branding hugely. You know, um, first of all, any entity um, uh, has basically. Uh, uh, or needs to basically articulate a deep purpose for its existence. Uh, and that's what ideally branding does. It basically, it brings into articulation a sense of purpose, a sense of being, a sense of reason to exist, you know, in context to others. And thereby what makes sense for you to exist for others and how, why will people come to you, you know, for what reasons. And when this thing happens and when, when, when this articulation comes into place, then we, we have a huge potential in place, right? So I think there are lots and lots of history museums of various kinds and museums which goes back to in time. And, and because Bihar Museum did this thing differently from a process perspective and got us on board, the articulation happened in a, in a particular way. So we, we just took what was there and, and articulated it in a certain manner. We manifested in, in, in a symbol which looks like this or which speaks like this, right? So, so from that perspective, I think that is where the potential lies. It's huge. And also the aspect of branding is, is making local global, right? So how that you take this, this, this aspect the, or this purpose and, and make it all encompassing, make it far and wide. You know, so how do, can it become another Taj Mahal uh, for the rest of the world? And how can you tell your stories? And branding helps you that with consistency, right? But in, in layperson terminology, uh, uh... What would be the avenues, whether, and, and I'm, I'm using the term layperson because now everybody talks about social media being, being the means of communication. So how does, how can a museum branding impact social media or the digital aspects? So if somebody asked me if I was starting on the Bihar Museum today, I would look at a digital outreach program very strongly. Would branding play a role in something like that? Absolutely. So uh, branding is medium agnostic, right? First lately, or, or channel agnostic, you know? So it applies in everything we do. That includes how does the me museum behave? You know, so we spoke, spoke about uh, the, the personality of the Bihar Museum. We spoke about behavior of the me uh, Bihar Museum. Now that personality and behavior does not necessarily mean uh, how does your gatekeeper behave? Of course, it means that also, but it means about how it actually will behave across everything we do. And what is the everything we do? And this, I don't know, I showed you that slide where there were circles and there was a little band in between. I was saying that band is actually the physical experience, but everything else is virtual. And the more and more the world is getting virtual. So we have to reach far and wide, you know, with, with all our stories. So the, the, the museum or the Bihar Museum needs to lie in people's mind. Uh, yeah. and, and that's where the crux of the matter. And we use all possible, all possible channels. Yeah. And, and I remember this discussion I had with Anjani Ji and the team. And when I was pushing forth saying that we have to go virtual strongly, we have to have a very powerful website, you know? And, and the uh, question was asked, what budget? I said the same budget you spend on actually creating the museum and everybody <laughs> laughed. Uh, but, but that was just purely to put a perspective that the amount of effort we need to put to make the museum powerfully virtually, right? Or in the minds of people is a lot, a lot of activity and work. Yeah. So now we have just uh, time for one last question to Anjani ji before we open up uh, the floor for uh, our, our guests to join for questioning. That Anjani ji, we've gone through this entire journey of the museum, right from the vision to the process to, to the execution of it. How do you see the impact of the Bihar Museum on, on upcoming museums in the country? Uh, the Bihar Museum Biennale is definitely a testament uh, to this 
leadership role that you, you have taken. Uh, but how do you see the impact on the city of Patna, the urban rejuvenation that it's, it will lead to, it, the perception change that is bringing about, and also in terms of tourism, uh, have, have you seen that impact or how are you seeing that impact come through? Yes. Uh, let me say one thing. Bihar Museum was not built only for people of Bihar. That time also we had the idea, you know, it will be the Museum of India and it will connect India with the world. That's why you have this Bihar Museum Binale 2021. So not only in this Binale, your Indian museums, but many international museums from different countries are participating and many more wants to participate. So that was the impact we wanted, that, that, is, that will happen. Of course, at the local level, we are getting very large number of visitors, especially young children, because you have a scheme also to bringing school children to museum. So local level, of course, uh, that number we have, we have one very nice number visiting uh, our museum, people visiting our museum. But the, the type of interest it has developed in other states. I'm getting requests from various states, how you did it, how you did the tendering, how you developed this concept. So many more states are now getting pressured, you know, to create something like this, some culture center. We are museum, I don't call it more like, you know, traditional museum. It's basically a center, culture center, where you have everything. And, and with, so now I'm getting requests from various states for sharing how it was done. And we are also getting, you know, quite good response nationally as well as internationally. And you don't have time, Batul, you see, perhaps. Yes, so I think we can, uh, Ayushi, you can tell us, can we take a question or two or, or do we need to wind up the session? Because I know the next session starts in another five minutes. No, it's already perhaps yeah. uh, the time is <laughs> over because the next panel is going to start. It's already started. It's already started, in fact. So maybe we can collect the questions and we can respond in writing to some of yeah. these questions. Yeah. We, we will, we will do that. That's a good idea. We'll do that. We'll do that. Thank, Thank you very much. And I, I enjoyed the session again very much with all of y'all as I've enjoyed working with all of y'all over so many years and, and through some challenging discussions, through, through arguments, but all very constructive and very happy that it has all come together like this. Thank you, everybody.